Welcome to Main Purpose Ministries audio service. Around 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus Christ took a stand against sin when he hung up on the cross and paid for it with his precious blood. Today, I'm asking you to show up, to stand up, and to speak out for the cause of Christ. He stood up for you. Now it's time to stand up for him. The world is quickly trying to say Christianity is irrelevant and unnecessary in the world we live in today. Prove them wrong. Show the evidence. So if you have your Bible, uh, Psalm 94 is where we're going to be today. Psalm 94. The other day I had jury duty. And it's one of those fun things you love. One of those fun things you like. It's one of those things you got to do. All right. It's one of those to do things. So and I went and I always get selected as a reserve. Like they they call up four panels of 12 people or and then they get them ready. But they only need 12, but they just need backups for in case someone gets disqualified for knowing them or somebody's a police officer, whatever. They, they kind of throw up as a flag or something, and they talk about it in the back. So I was on the third panel of 12, and thankfully they didn't need me, so I was able to go go on and uh, do the things I needed to do, uh, go into you know, things like that, but it got me thinking, because a pastor can't just sit, okay, especially a preacher in that aspect, a pastor, I guess, can, but a preacher can't sit and not be thinking of his next point, his next quote, his next story, and it's just the way we're geared, you can be listening to another one, and that's what hit me with today with jury duty, and what if today, I could send you a trial date. What if today in the mail you would have received a subpoena that said you must appear in court? And now you know this is this is if it's a witness, this is if somebody's got to speak up, somebody who was there, somebody who has to testify. It means you have to show up to this particular day. So you've been sent this, and today is your trial date. And today, if you can, I want you to put your imagination caps on and I want you to imagine not a church house, but rather a courthouse. Because I promise you, if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to be in some of them. Okay? I promise you that. But today is your trial date. Listen, but you've been chosen not to speak on behalf of Christ, but rather be the evidence that what he does is real and true. Satan has charged Christianity with being non-existent, irrelevant, and undesired. His defense includes his temptation, the decline in church attendance, and the growth in the amount of sin in the past year. What are we seeing? How are we doing? It seems like good points. Albeit Satan's got a great defense when we look at the world today. When we turn on our news, when we go into our schools, when we're seeing what we're learning and more and more sin, hurt, hatred, judgment, all in all, looks like Satan's winning. But see, there's some evidence that he didn't account for. Today, if you're saved, you're the best evidence that could be at any trial for Jesus' sake. Today, it isn't so much that he hung up on the cross, he rose from the dead. That's amazing in itself, but he changed you if you're saved today. If he saved you today, you're the best evidence, proof that there could ever be. What I want to tell you is I've been called to be the defense attorney today for Christ. And I have chosen you to be my evidence, to be my proof. I believe God is still real today. I believe the Bible is still true. And I believe every single day, Satan, through the world, through leaders, through ministers, even ministers and churches, I believe that. If you give, him, say, give Satan enough, he'll take the rest, okay? 
what I'm telling you is every single day he's trying to push it further and further out. How much more should a Christian be trying to push it more and more back in? Let me tell you something. If it's overflowing, you know that clock, you, you know that closet. That closet in your house, that one that's overfilled. And you know you're just trying to get that one article of clothing in there. You know, you barely crack the door. Karen knows, okay? You, bar- you barely crack the door and you're just trying to stuff it in there just so it'll get clothes. Or maybe that bin, you know, you're, you're, you're cleaning up after Christmas or a holiday and you've got that bin of all your ornaments and all your things and you just need that one more thing to go in there and you're just stuffing it, you're sitting on it, you're stomping on it, suitcase when you go, when you go maybe on a holiday, when you go on a vacation, same way, we've all been there, done that. And I believe the problem with the world is Satan is packing more out or taking more out than we're packing back in. I believe we, as evidence of Christ's living, His birth, His resurrection, the fact that He can still save, should be a whole lot more prevalent than the other things in this world. Why? Because the other things are going to rot away. The other things are going to go away, okay? It's just, what are we trying to stuff back in there? Today, don't let Satan outstuff yours. Don't let him force it. Don't let him push more in than you can. Don't let him fill it all up with all this junk when all you need is Jesus. Go dump your bin. Go empty your closet. Take your sin. Take your temptation. Take your hurts. Take your failures. And bring the evidence of just what he's already done. You don't need what he's going to do tomorrow. We've got so much he's already done that it'll fill up the whole house. Probably the church house too. Probably the school house. Probably the whole towns if you put them together. What if we brought our evidence today? It's Christ is standing in the, in the courtroom. We're standing up next to Him and I've chosen you to be evidence. For Satan has already brought up the temptation, the decline in church attendance, and the growth and the amount of sin. But the problem is, it's our turn to speak. The question is, are we going to do it? Are we going to speak out for Christ or not? Are we going to let Him be captive? Are we going to admit that Christianity is dead and gone? Are we going to admit that it's just going to keep going and there's no salvation, there's no truth, there's no gospel? Are we just going to let Satan run over us? Or are we going to stand up and free Christ from these charges? Are we going to show that it's relevant? Are we going to show that it's necessary? Are we going to show that we desire it today? If Christ for once relied upon you, would there be enough evidence to set him free of these charges? Well, let's look at the evidence and you'll see. Psalm 94. Look at what it says. Verse 1. Psalm 94, verse 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, look at, said it again. It said it two times in a row. Show thyself. Give me some evidence. Give me some proof. Show me that you're real. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? We're just going to keep letting them run over us. Take our rights, our values. Teach our kids how to live, how to work, how to walk. Teach all these other things going on. How long are we going to let the wicked just run over us? That's what they're saying. How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? Satan's already spoke out, right? He's already talked of all the bad things. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. I would say Christianity is a godly heritage. I would say our country is built upon that heritage. And it's slowly breaking into pieces. Oh, why? Because Satan doesn't like to take the whole clump all at once, right? Just a little piece here and there. Just a little here and there. 
I mean, you, you know it. I mean, it's the way it is. Say it like this. I mean, this is a silly example, but say just the sound on your TV went out. You'd work on it, right? You'd go get maybe a speaker. You'd try to route it through an audio. You might. You'd, you'd try to give it a little hand. But what if the whole thing goes out? The, vi the, the video, the cable, the link, the, just the electricity going to it. Just You'd throw it away. The problem is Satan's not wanting you to throw it away. Satan's wanting you to slowly, slowly, slowly give up more and more and more until there's nothing left. If he can take it all in one lump sum, good for him. But that's not what he's doing to our people. We're on trial today. We're standing up against him. We're having to fight the fight now because we didn't stand then. How much more is it going to take? How many more pieces are going to have to break off? How long are the wicked going to have to triumph before we're going to stand up and say something? We're on trial today. It's your choice. Speak up or not. Plead the fifth. Uh-oh. Are we going to stand up and say something? It's your choice today. Let's have prayer and find out what we do. Lord, I just want to thank you for this day. Lord, I just ask you to bless us and be with us. Lord, just, uh, just open up your word to us, and I pray that you would just uh, show us your will and your way. Lord God, if I was on trial, Lord, I pray that I would have enough courage and faith to stand up for you no matter the consequences. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now what I want you to point out really quickly before we get started with the points is I'm not, I'm using this as a scenario only. Will Christ ever go on a trial where he may be found guilty and go to jail forever? No. I'm using it as an example because we, of anything else in the world, what should be evidence that God is true? Those that believe in it. It's simple, it's there, and every, tri every trial, you know this, is won by evidence and proof. Whether it be civil, whether it be criminal, and now today, spiritual. What if we did see this trial? What if we did go up? What if Christ, Christianity is being thrown out of our schools, thrown out of our government, thrown out of most churches? That would scare you enough. Is there enough left? Because we've been broken into pieces. Is there enough left to prove that God is still real and necessary? I believe there is. And we're going to look at that today. Today, number one, in that evidence, in that, in that pool of proof, or whatever you would like to call it, today I bring first to the stand as defense attorney for Christ. Today I bring number one, the face of forgiveness. The face of forgiveness. The face, okay? The forefront, okay? The standout crowd. Maybe you've heard it old time saying the poster child. If I was to say old time rock and roll, who would you say? Poster child. He revolutionized it all. He changed it all. The way it works, the way it worked, the way it is. Elvis Presley, the king of what? Get it right, church. We're living in the Bible Belt, but we're living in His Belt too. In that same sense, that's where it started. That's where it happened. Mississippi, Louisiana. The king of rock and roll is what made what it is today. Why? He's the poster child. Is he the only rock and roll star ever? No. Is he the only one that ever played rock and roll? No. But the king of rock and roll. Here's one we may not want to admit. What about the king of pop? Who's that poster child? He died. He's, 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 he's no longer living. Michael Jackson, like him or not, that's what they regarded. He was the poster child. And you either loved it, liked it, hated it, it doesn't matter. But that's, what, that's who stood out in the forefront to the pop industry, to the rock and roll industry. Guess what? Here's one you'll get. What about Subway? Jared. Who said that? Oh, yeah. Jared. You look at Subway a whole lot different because of the story that was shown about one man. One man. Jared. The poster child. Like it or not, it's a face you're going to have burning in every time you eat your little $5 foot long. It's in there. You know him. We know him. You know, it's amazing. I could, I could ask these 
I could ask these youngsters over here, is that what you call them today? I could ask them about a favorite cartoon, a favorite comic book, a favorite superhero. They'd have one right off the bat, whether it was their favorite, whether it wasn't, one that's way more popular than the rest. Do you know, it's amazing. This is the scariest thing that you'll ever know. They're the two most recognized symbols, symbols, just symbols, in the world today is the cross, and Superman symbol. Two most recognized in the world, anywhere you go, the face, the poster child, the front, the forefront, the one out on the battle lines, the one making the difference, the one selling the copies, and the ones that's being remembered. Just to name a few. We hit them just right there. The world wants a standout today. The world wants something that's out there. And Christ isn't anymore because we've stopped talking about Him. We've stopped carrying Him to the grocery store, to the shopping malls, to the schoolhouse. Then they wonder why nobody knows about Him. Wonder why nobody knows all the verses in the Bible. Wonders why nobody knows the Ten Commandments. Wonders why nobody knows the things intricately laid out in the Word of God. Why? We're not telling them anymore. Did you tell anybody about Jesus this last week, honestly? One person. I didn't raise my hand because I did. I'm asking you to raise yours. One person in this room told somebody about Jesus. And then we wonder why the world don't know about Jesus. We wonder why they're not filling our church pews. We wonder why we've got just a low crowd, a low number. We wonder why there's not hundreds of people running to our baptismal pool, running to our VBSs. Wait, we don't have one. Running to all these other things. There isn't any anymore. All that's left is me and you. What I want to tell you is when something's going to get done, you're going to have to buckle down and say it's going to be me or nobody. We're all that's left. I believe today there's too much discrimination based on too little. I believe, generally speaking, the South is one of the worst places to be discriminated against, whether it be by the weight you are, That's one. The color of your skin, the education level that you have, the amount of money you contain in the bank, automatically they already think it about you. They don't wait to look up on the inside. They don't wait to question you. They don't wait to see who you truly are. But they've already got you figured out. The world has painted it already. Why? Because someone went ahead in advance of you and became the poster child, the standalone, the out front, and now everybody under that category is just like they are. Because why? We quit giving them a chance. We'll just go with the flow. We'll just go out with it. What I want to tell you is today, Christianity can win. If it's going to, though, we've got to prove that forgiveness is real. Not judgment, not discrimination, not racism. That's what we're giving today. That's what's shown on the news today. That's what we hear about every single day. We don't hear about people forgiving one another. We don't hear about people not holding grudges. We don't hear about people just lovey-dovey anymore. That was a funny saying a long time ago. Just hanging out, just settling a dispute over some coffee and saying it's good and going on. We don't do that anymore. The world has taught us to hate and we accept it. We like it. That's what everyone else is doing. So why not hate our fellow brother and sister? Why not hate our president? Uh Uh-oh. We don't like that, do we? But we do. We'll yell at the TV just like we do at football games and how crazy and stupid he is when the Bible says to pray for our leaders. We've joined in the crowd that we just don't want to admit having a party. Here we are today. Let's be honest. We don't like it when preachers are honest, but we're being honest today because that's what God told me to do. 
I want to tell you something, that the burden of proof, that's how you win a case in trial law, civil law, whatever case may be. That's how you win. The burden of proof is yours. It's your job to prove Christ is real. Not Satan's job to prove we need Him. It's your job to show forgiveness is real. It's your job to be out in the forefront. It's your job to make it happen. If you want to see people saved, give them a reason to be. Show them how to be. Take them to the church that preaches Christ. Take them down the hall. Get your Bible out of your coffee table and read it sometimes. It'll scare you. Satan doesn't have to do one thing. Sin is in our nature. We're going to do it anyway. We've got to actively seek Christ and forgive others before we can be forgiven. We've fallen, I believe, today. We have sinned. Case closed. We've lost. Satan won, right? No! We've been given even better offers. We don't have to have sin. We don't have to die and go to hell. We get Christ and we've got a place called heaven. The world needs to see the change in us. The world needs to see different. If Christians don't need Christ anymore, what are we? If we don't need church, if we don't need Bible, if we don't need an active... I mean, let me tell you something. I would go absolutely nuts if I wasn't a pastor and I had to study the Word of God as much as I do. And which is not as much as I should, I promise you. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a believer in God. I believe we're all attested to study to show thyself approved. That wasn't a, ser- that wasn't a scripture for just the preachers, okay? That was for us to know these things. The Bible says to hide His Word in your heart that you may not sin against God. Now we're down to begging. We got to get them to church. How we're going to do it? Let's show that we're changed. Let's show that we need Christ. We're Christians. Let's need Him. Let's show up. Let's say it. I need my Jesus. So I'm going to be at church. I'm going to be every time the doors are open. I'm going to share God's word. When family comes over, guess what? We're going to church together or they can leave. I hate that excuse. I can't stand it. Well, my family's coming in today. We can't come to church. That's the most important group of people you need in church. That's the ones you care about the most, right? They're going to die and go to the same hell as the guy down the street. We don't care though. All we care about is this life. Heard at the Heritage Festival, we've got all of our lives planned every day what groceries we need what job we're going to have what we're going to spend our paycheck on who we're going to go see next week every single day we try to plan to the T until we get up in age whatever it is doesn't matter how old you are you've got something planned for tomorrow even if it's just to lay home and do nothing you've got it planned But how often do we plan everything about this world and never think about the next one at all? We're too busy looking for any excuse not to go, right? What I want to tell you is we need to be looking for more excuses to go. Because we're the Christians. We're the believers in Jesus and they're not seeing us at church. They're watching the pastor and three or four people struggle on Sunday and Wednesday nights just to get by Because we don't love Him enough. We don't do it enough. We don't get it enough. We don't need it enough, I don't guess. Wouldn't we show up? I need my paycheck, so I'm going to show up. No. I need my Christ, so I'm going to show up. That's the same way you are at your job. That's the same way you are with groceries. When you need it, whether you like Walmart or not, you're going, to, you're going to show up. Maybe not. You might go to Market Basket. No, I'm going to Big Star. Can't do that, so I'm not. I'm going to go to Walmart. I need a place 
I need to prove that forgiveness is real. You are the face of Christ. You are the hands and feet. You are the evidence, the proof that He's real. If you're doing nothing with it, who will? Today we need less judges and more forgivers. Number two. I got kind of caught up. You can see me sweating up here. I'll get over it. Number two, we need evidence of grace. We have that, okay? We, if we have the face of forgiveness, of course we've got to show evidence of grace. Grace is my favorite word in the Bible. Yours might be faith. Yours might be salvation. Yours could be Jesus. Um, ADs is probably AD, right? It's probably in there somewhere, you know, AD. You're viral, you know, never mind. Get over it. That was supposed to be a joke, and nobody laughed, okay? But we get, except Miss Susan. Thank you, Miss Susan. But we, we get this point where evidence of grace. See, most trials are won based on evidence alone. The question is today how would you explain, how would you explain grace? To someone who had never heard the word. We do it a lot in school, right? If you went up to a blind kid who would never seen the color red, how would you describe it? Right? So, the I don't want you to do that. I want you to, if someone had never heard or felt or understood in their heart the word grave, how would you explain it to somebody? The question is this. Is there any evidence of grace in your life? The judge will be looking for the evidence. God, when we're standing before Him, before we enter into heaven, I do believe we'll be standing before Him in judgment in that sense. Before we walk through those gates, He's going to be looking for evidence of Jesus in you. The question is, does Jesus have enough evidence from us? Do we prove that we are saved? Do we prove that we do have grace? Do we give enough testimony? My favorite thing to do in church, whether you think it's the preaching or not, it's not. My favorite thing to do is hear in praises at praise time. You want to know why? That just affirms to me that God is still answering prayer. That we're more blessed than we should be. Hmm. It proves that what I'm preaching and what I live for and what I believe all my life still works. Jesus still works. Grace is still sufficient. Satan has clouded our thinking. He's tempted our kids. And he's given so many inadequate replacements and taught us to tolerate sin and compromise our values. That's Satan in a hole, right? It's not so much we make the bad decision, he just kind of clouds us from making the better ones, right? It's not so much him doing the so bad, but it's the fact that he tempts us enough to where we follow the bad. One of my favorites is tolerate. Nowhere in the Bible did Jesus say tolerate sin. Nowhere did he say compromise your beliefs because everybody else should be equal. I believe all humans are equal, but I don't believe that gay marriage should be put alongside spiritual marriage in Jesus Christ. I don't believe that abortion should be put alongside all these other ideas of what raising children or not raising them should be. I'm just here to tell you that I don't like tolerating. Nowhere did it say that. It says, stand firm, stand your ground, sin is sin. That's what my Bible says. No, we're supposed to just tolerate the new stuff. They're going to do it anyway. They're going to come in. They're going to live the way they want. They're going to act the way they want. We just got to live that way because they're all going to be in heaven with us anyway. Where did you get that verse from? It ain't in there. It's nowhere in the Bible. People who do sin and we tolerate, we go to heaven. Mm, Amazing. And our biggest tool of all against the bad thinking, the inadequate replacements, the tolerating and the compromising. The biggest tool we've got, 
Satan can't even take away from us. Grace. Let me ask you this. This is going to be kind of silly. How many of you have ever hammered in a nail without picking up the hammer? You just watch the hammer hit the nail in without doing a thing. See, for a tool to do work, you've got to pick it up. You've got to use it. It ain't enough just to say I have grace and be done. We need to use it. We need to show the world the evidence of our grace to show that it makes a difference. Satan can't take it away. He can't hurt it. He can't move it. He can't do anything, but he can stop us from picking it up and using it. Some people have their grace on a shelf. They only need it ever so often, right? I need mine every day. I don't carry it in a back pocket. I carry it in my heart, but I use it every day. Stop settling for less than what God already gave you. Stop settling. Christ already gave you grace, which is better than everything else you could ever get, right? So don't settle for the other ways that we seek and the other things that the world has to have to make them happy, to make them think it's all worth it. You wouldn't, listen, mm, how many of you would take a brand new car paid off? Somebody gave it to you, with no notes. No note. They paid it off and gave it to you brand new 2015, right? Because that's the next year. They gave you a brand new one. Said, here you go, and guess what? We're going to pay the gas, no matter how much it costs, no matter how much you drive, no matter if it's a Prius or an Escalade. It doesn't matter. How many of you would trade that in for a used car with notes, and you got to pay your own gas bill? It doesn't matter what the car was, right? If as long as it got you from point A to point B, I'm going to drive the one with no notes and the one's going to pay the gas for me. Don't take what God already gives you and trade it for something worse. Anything the world can offer, admit please, that it's worse than what God's already done on the cross. So quit settling for it. Just go pick up the one you have. I know it's old. It's over 2,000 years old. But they still can't beat it. They still can't charge enough. They, let me tell you something. How can you beat freedom from sin and free in the same sentence? You can't. You can't beat that amazing sweet meal. If you was to find that on a Walmart shelf, you would pay any price for it. God already gave it to you for free. Accept what He's given you. Just accept it. I know we have new technology. We have new cell phones, new TVs. We have new vehicle systems. We have new music player. We have all of those stuff, but the same need for Christ is the same. And nothing can outdo it. Nothing can do it better. There's no bigger Jesus or smaller Jesus based on how much you can afford. You get the same thing, same price. Everybody gets it. Everybody has it. Free and clear evidence all and salvation for everybody thank you I made that up myself right on the spot you saw that right but listen don't settle for things that aren't enough grace is still enough don't settle for things that aren't last one we're through this is the quick one this is my favorite one this is fun you'll get it we all know we are the face. We know that we have the evidence of grace. But, number three, proof of purchase. Do you show proof of purchase by the way you live? The Bible says that Jesus Christ in, in, in 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy 2, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says that he was made ransom for us. That means we were bought, right? So we should be the proof of purchase. We should show that we've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Born bound for hell. But Christ came and bought us from Satan. From our struggle, from our doubt. See, 
I'm going to put it in a new way. I'm going to remove my notes for a second and just skip all of that. I'll, I want to end it this way. It just made me think of it. We mentioned it earlier. But just like a receipt frees you from Walmart, the same grace frees you from sin. What I want to tell you is we... Got it. How many times have you ever went into Walmart, paid for something, went outside, came back in, and paid for it again? Paid for it again? Paid for it again? Paid for it? Just kept going in throughout through the aisle. Number one, you wouldn't stand in the line that long. Because number 13, the checkout line is be closed, probably. We don't have 24-7 at Manny. But anyway, the whole point and all the act, what I'm saying, you will not go around and pay for the things you've already paid for. What I want to tell you is why do we keep paying for the things God already paid for on the cross? Why do we keep letting our past hold us back? We keep letting our anger and our temper and our depression and our sadness and our struggle and so-and-so's relationship with so-and-so who made me mad because so-and-so said this about this one and this one called me up and told me all about it. We let that get us all bent out of shape. But guess what? God's already paid for it. Why do we keep going back through the line and saying, oh, let me pay for this again? We buy a gallon of milk for $10 now, you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't know what it is. We're not going to go back through the line and say, hey, I want to pay for this again. I know I just paid for it, but I just want to pay for it again. No! It's stupid. You're absolutely laughing at me. That's good because it's absurd. But you do it every day when you don't give your burdens to Jesus. You do it every day when you don't trust Him with your hurt. When you don't trust Him with your struggle. Every time you don't trust Him to deal with that person that's driving you nuts. That's going through the line and paying for it again. Don't pay for what God already bought upon the cross. Don't keep holding on to things grace has already freed you from. Let me tell you something. And this is it, I promise you. The receipt gets you out the door free and clear. Jesus holds the receipt. This is it. You've got to understand this. You've got to hold with me. Jesus is the only way out. He bought you. Why isn't it Oprah? Why isn't it good works? Why isn't it education level? Why isn't it a certain age? Why isn't any of those? Because Jesus already bought you. So you're His. Why? Because He paid for it on the cross with His blood with his skin, with his flesh, with his bones, even though none of his bones were broken, which was prophesied in Isaiah. Isn't that amazing? But, proof of purchase. Jesus purchased you. All you've got to do is be the proof of it. He is the only way out. People can try many things. They can think there's hundreds of other ways but just like walking out with stuff and no receipt, you will get caught. I want to go free. If you leave without Christ, you can never go free. You can go do what you want. You can go where you want. Nobody's going to stop you from going home, going to the store, going out to eat, going to the casino, going to the bar, wherever y'all going to go. I don't know where y'all going to go. That's some places. You can go wherever you want, but you can never go free. You can only go free when Christ, because He has the receipt. The other day, and I'm, I'm at, this is my fun story. The other day, we went and bought a four-way lug wrench. Y'all have seen these. They look like big X's. Because the one they give you with your, with your car, your, the stock one, won't break off anything, if you know what I mean. Right? So I went and bought a gigantic one. I mean, it's the biggest one you can buy. A big, uh, Four-way lug wrench. You got all the sizes on it and everything. Just because the bigger it is, the more leverage you got, okay? The more more pulling power, okay? Well, I go up there, it's me. I go up there to the to the checkout, and the, the lady can't fit it into a bag. 
She can't. It's big. I mean, it's it's this big. I'm telling you. I don't, and I can do that because I don't know if y'all seen my truck, but it's lifted now, so I can use the big one. It wouldn't work on a car because it'd hit the ground every time you turn it. But anyway, that's a whole other sermon. But we get to that point. I get up there and I say, I'm paying for it, and she can't fit it in a bag. And she said, here, you'll just have to carry it out. You know you love doing that because every guardian, every little security guard, every little greeter fellow will stop you when you don't have it in a bag. You can put anything you want in a bag without a receipt or nothing. They'll let you walk on out. Don't do it. Don't say your pastor told you to. But what I'm saying is, you get it? You got it? It was amazing. They gave the ticket to Lindsay, and guess what? We got out. Why? Not because we had the bag. You can cover it up. You can hide it. You can put your sin any way you want to. You didn't get out any freer without the receipt. It doesn't matter about the bag. It doesn't matter how open you are about your sin, your failures, your shame. It doesn't matter who knows it. But if you go out with Jesus, you go out free and clear. Today, that's what I want to do today. If you leave without Him, you cannot escape, escape the depths of hell. Christ has bought you though. The proof of purchase is leaving out with Him. Today, let's do that. We can win this trial. We can beat Satan because we are the proof of purchase. We are the evidence of grace and we are the face of forgiveness. Today, you're on trial. It's your turn to stand and shout. Are you going to? It's our turn to stand up for Him. He hung on the cross for you. Now it's up to us to stand up for Him. Thank you for listening to this message. I pray that it blessed you. And if it did in any way, please share it with someone else. Because the trial date's been set. And we as Christians need to speak up for Jesus. Because no one else is.